Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for another issue of Texas Insider TV. I'm Jim Cardle. We're here today with Congressman Michael McCall from Texas's 10th Congressional District in his fourth term serving in Washington. Congressman, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me, Jim. In particular, uh, as it relates to the 10th anniversary of 9-11 coming up here, you are chairman of the subcommittee in charge of all oversight for borderland security and national security. So let's get right to that. You've just come off a hearing you held in Houston earlier this week. You're going to be going up to have another hearing in the state of Boston, but tell us what you learned this week down in Houston and, and what Texans need to know about international threats there. Well, you know, when uh, Bin Laden was killed, uh, which is a great victory for the United States, mm -hmm. the beginning of the end in, in the war on terror, uh, we found a lot of documents in his compound, on his computer. Uh, one of the things we found was that he was still uh, targeting oil tankers, which they have done in the past. and. Uh, off the coast of Yemen, they had success. Uh, USS Cole, they the targeted. The Cole folks know about, right? A little dinghy that blew, you know, blew a hole in the side. And so Houston, with a third of the uh, refiner, uh, refining capacity for the United States, for the energy sector, uh, is a, a big target. So we held hearings to uh, see where uh, we could do a better job in terms of hardening that target. Imagine if a small vessel went up to an oil tanker and. Uh, was able to uh, blow it up. Mm -hmm. uh, the ship channels closed down for weeks. Uh, it causes major devastation to our economy uh, and the flow of energy uh, as it's a major distribution hub for the, for the country. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of folks don't realize Houston is, if not the nation's largest port in terms of imports or exports, what are the numbers there in terms of how significant for the nation it is? Well, in, it, in terms of, it's one of the largest ports in the world. Yeah, essentially. Okay. And again, when you have a third of the refinery capacity there, uh, it makes it critically uh, important. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and let me just say that, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, are we safe, safer today mm -hmm. since 9-11? And I, I think I would answer that yes, uh, but we're not safe. Um, you know, since 9-11, we have gotten so much better at our human intelligence. The Predator drones in Pakistan have taken out high-valued targets. Okay. Uh, we've greatly dismantled their command and control operation, obviously killing bin Laden. We just killed the number two guy mm -hmm. uh, a couple days ago. Uh, and now they've evolved into more franchise-like operations, one to two men operations. Uh, you have the cleric in Yemen, uh, who still poses a great threat uh, in, in a variety of ways. He's still looking at chemical weapons, explosives to uh, blow up airplanes, but he's also radicalizing over the internet uh, the Muslim youth here in America. And we held, held hearings on that issue as well. This is the man that radicalized Major Hassan at Fort Hood, who's responsible for killing 13 of our soldiers. Uh, so I view that as one of the one of the greater threats out there. But So uh, is, it, is it true to say, for instance, that prior to 9-11, the, the national security almost was more uh, implemented at a local level, kind of a, kind of a policing, and there was no Department of Defense effort and FBI and CIA, whereas post 9-11, now we're getting into more of this international stuff you're talking well, about. Well, I mean, it, it was, but it wasn't coordinated between the agencies. It okay. wasn't coordinated federal, state, and local. You know, there was the stovepipes between, yes. you know, the commu intelligence community or uh, the Department of Defense, uh, and so I think there's a greater coordination between the agencies, which is necessary. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the the work that the Navy SEAL Team Six did and the intelligence community did in their uh, extraordinary effort to take down Bin Laden, I, I just can't tell you how grateful as a nation uh, we are. We won't know the names of the faces, uh, but we uh, owe them a, a great deal of gratitude. And in terms right now today of of both, this is a two-part question, your fears for national security, but you're also involved to a great extent on our border security yep. as uh, terrorists may or may not try to be get through there. First, what is your greatest fear f at the national security level? You know, it's hard to pinpoint one because there are so many, but uh, I, if I could just do a couple, I think, I think okay. cybersecurity is going to be one of the uh, greatest emerging threats uh, coming out. Uh, uh, with cybersecurity attacks, you can take down power grids, financial institutions, cause grave economic damage. And 
uh, that kind of offensive capability that we have as, as a nation, the Air Force has, uh, in the wrong hands could do uh, great destruction. So that's not something in the movies anymore. It's real and there's potential. No, there. it's it's very real. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're, uh, you know, I, I work a lot. I'm on the Speaker Cybersecurity Task Force to come up with uh, how to implement to harden our federal networks as well as the private sector. Every federal agency has been hacked into. Large really? amounts of data has been uh, stolen. Uh, intellectual property, the Pentagon's been hacked into. Um, Every all, federal agency, I imagine there's about 100 of them. Na uh, NASA. Uh, and you know, a lot of this is coming from China to uh, espionage. But it, it's the cyber warfare attack that keeps me up at night the most because it could cause such great uh, destruction. And that, you know, a lot of people think the internet is in the ether, some satellite yes. driven thing. It's actually a giant uh, fiber optic cable that goes around the world. And the most vulnerable spot and the most shallow spot is off the coast of Yemen. And so that's, that's a real uh, concern as well. Folks don't realize that actually there is a cable in, under the Pacific Ocean or under the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. and, and Yemen, you're saying, is where it's the shallowest would be the Gulf of uh, Yemen, I guess, there. Yeah, as you're going out and then up towards Iran, that's probably the most vulnerable Part the other the other concern I have is with this Arab Spring they call it. Okay. Uh, the idea that the Muslim you know, you know that it's going to be all peaceful democracy, but the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt and of course Iran sees this as a great opening, great opportunity for them to fill the vacuum and the power void that's there in the Middle East. So you're not talking about literally seasons of spring, fall, and summer that the spring of their rejuvenating, so to speak. Yeah, they call it the spring of their democracy, which, you know, we want to encourage democracy, but mm -hmm. with that it comes a power vacuum that we want to ensure is not filled by radical uh, Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, and imagine this, this is one that really keeps me up at night, is uh, Saudi Arabia, okay. the majority of the energy supply for the world. Uh, royal families on top of the Wahhabis, uh, tempest in a teapot, if the if the Wahhabi sect decides to throw out the royal family and take over the country, uh, we will have a major energy crisis in this country. Okay, and then how about, that's at the national, international scale, how about a fear of the southern border? Are, are there still concerns about infiltration, uh, folks coming across the border to do damage to our state in particular? Well, I, I think, you know, there is a, a Caracas-Tehran connection between Venezuela and Iran, so you have a lot of Hezbollah presence in, in South America. Okay. But I really think the drug cartels, you know, they're, they're not Al-Qaeda, but I think they're terrorists. Uh, they've, uh, you know, 40,000 people have been killed in Mexico since Calderon declared his war. 6,000 in Juarez. I've been into Juarez. It's the same security they use in Afghanistan. I was going to ask, because you've been down there, you've mm -hmm. toured the border, you've mm -hmm. seen the technology that it either is or is not in place. Yeah. And I think the, the missing piece, you know, Congressman Quayer and I from Laredo were able to get three UAVs for the state of Texas uh, to um, patrol the skies on the border, mm -hmm. which I think is going to be very helpful. But the technology piece is not in place yet. We have the fencing uh, in place, but the technology piece, sensor surveillance equipment, needs to be fully implemented. We need more Border Patrol agents down there uh, rotating the guard out. Um, but, you know, the, the thing, uh, a lot of people think that the drug cartels are just in Mexico. Okay. They're here in the United States, and they're here in, in Austin, Texas. They're in Houston. Operating cells, organization. Absolutely. And we just had a bust of 50 La Familia the other day in Austin. We have a Sheriff Garcia in Harris County has arrested many of them. San Antonio, uh, Dallas. And so the, the fact that the presence, they're here, and we'll, what we want to avoid is a scenario where all the killing that's going on in Mexico doesn't start to escalate uh, here in the United States. And that, that's uh, why uh, securing that border is so important. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate your work in that regard. We're visiting with Congressman Michael McCall from the 10th Congressional District here in Austin. Over to Katie, Chairman of the Subcommittee of Oversight and Investigations. One final question because your time's valuable. Really appreciate you coming by. Thanks for having me. Presidents are often known uh, for a thematic uh, type impression in history, uh, certain periods of time, and President Obama's pivoted, so to speak, as he says, to focus on jobs. But in the meantime, there is all this international concern. Do you see any international uh, impressions that the Obama administration is either sorely lacking at or is it making great strides at this time? 
Well, I, I have to commend him on the killing of Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, the right decision. Uh, it wouldn't have taken me long to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of going to high, uh, good intelligence and special forces, I think, is a, a model that we're going to start looking at. We can't, you know, nation build everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have to move away from that model you know, and move towards, you know, using good intelligence and special forces. On the other hand, I think he's perceived as, as weak. Um, uh, in the international community. In the international community, and particularly in the radical Islamic community. Uh, the idea, the naive approach that he can sit down with the president of Iran mm -hmm. and uh, embrace him and sing Kumbaya is just a very naive foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, these are dangerous forces, and they only understand force. Uh, and, and the idea that we can negotiate some sort of diplomacy with Iran is, is very uh, short-sighted, I think, puts us, uh, compromises our national security. Okay, well, Congressman, we're going to leave it there. I appreciate your time. I know you're busy, and uh, I should have mentioned you've had experience in state government as well, working for the Attorney General's office, your service to Texas. Appreciate it. We hope you'll come back as uh, the year progresses and as the international concerns come up. Thanks for coming by. Thanks, Jim. Folks, appreciate be sure to join us again for another issue of Texas Insider. Remember, you're either an insider or you're not. I'm Jim Cardle. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.